All right, I think we're ready to get started. Okay. So hello and welcome. My name is Lisa Mickney. I'm the director of the Hampton Library in Bridgehampton. Thank you everyone for coming and for the other libraries who are participating. I'm so excited about this conversation about Mary Rogers and her book, Shy. I just finished reading it. I can't wait to hear more about it and Mary, but let me start off by introducing David Alpern, who'll be leading the conversation. David was a reporter, writer, and senior editor at Newsweek magazine, working mostly in the national affairs and international sections, but he also coordinated the Newsweek poll of public opinion at home and abroad. Then in 1982, he launched Newsweek On Air, a weekly hour-long network radio broadcast, later a podcast, heard on stations across the country and around the world, via Armed Forces Radio. It featured interviews with Newsweek staffers and the newsmakers, including Katherine Hepburn, Katherine Graham, Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein, Nancy Reagan, Nora Ephron, Rosemary Clooney, and Dustin Hoffman, to name a few. Then, 30 years later, as Newsweek hit hard times, David Alpern took the show independent and nonprofit. And as for your ears only, um, so we're in good hands this evening. Um, now David is a full-time resident of Sag Harbor, New York, moderating presentations and discussions for local libraries like tonight. Plus he writes book reviews for the East Hampton Star and plays a lot of what he calls nearly tennis. <laughs> I'll now turn it over to David who will introduce our special guest. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Lisa Mickney, uh, Bridget Logan, Emily Guerrero at the Hampton Library for the introduction and for making today's extraordinary online arrangements for so many other East End libraries. Uh, thanks also to all of you out there in Zoom Hampton for joining us. And special thanks to our special guest, New York Times Chief Theater Critic Jesse Green, co-author of Shy, the alarmingly outspoken memoirs of Mary Rogers copies of which will be available for purchase online from Bookhampton in East Hampton with a book plate signed by Mr. Green uh, through a link that you will be able to find in the chat. Uh, in the chat too, you can write questions anytime for Mr. Green to answer at the end. But first, a uh, brief musical answer to the question posed in the East Hampton Star Review of this most rousing and revealing memoir, Why Shy? It's a young Carol Burnett via creaky TV kinescope in a scene from the 1959 musical Once Upon a Mattress, based on the tale of the princess and the pea, for which Mary Rogers wrote the score, of which the most well-known is this tune. Now you'll have to give me a little moment here to get it up. Share screen. Sound. I think I see share sound. Yes, okay, well, we should be good. So let's try it. I've always been shy. Thank you, Carol. 
And now to our guest. Jesse Green was still a kid when he began singing the praises, or at least the musical phrases, of Mary Rogers, daughter of Broadway and Hollywood star composer Richard Rogers. Uh, Green was in the chorus of his summer camp production of Once Upon a Mattress, uh, which became Mary's only Broadway hit, now much revived around the country, especially in high schools. And in high school himself, Green played the show's male lead, Prince Dauntless. He also appeared in far from Broadway stagings of her daddy's hits, Oklahoma and South Pacific. Later with a degree from Yale in English and theater, uh, Green worked on and around Broadway as a gopher, copyist, musical coordinator. Uh, then he wrote about theater and other subjects for the arts and leisure section of the Times for New York Magazine and for the Times Sunday Magazine before being named the paper's co-chief critic, then co no longer. Uh, Green also has written fiction and nonfiction books, including The Velveteen Father, An Unexpected Journey to Parenthood, praised as an intimate, witty account of his transformation from gay Greenwich Village single to Brooklyn family man with a husband and two adopted sons. Uh, they also had a house in Sag Harbor for several years and enjoyed visiting Mary Rogers' house out here in Quag, where she referred to conservative neighbors as Quaglodites. Uh, Green first approached Mary and her second husband, Hank Edel, for help in writing a profile of their composer son, Adam, now also a Tony winner, and found them the shockingly free-flowing font of inside stories. Later, he sought her input on a piece about the stage and screenwriter Arthur Lawrence, to whom in the book she refers repeatedly as the little shit, as do many in show business, I learned, but uh, about whom she said now famously, call me when he's dead. Uh, and yet along the way, Mary made Lawrence Adam's godfather, or so it's reported. Maybe Green can explain that contradiction. Finally, Mary came to Green for help writing the memoirs for which she had a contract, uh, but only on and off confidence and commitment. It took him about a decade to turn their two years of freewheeling conversations about her life and loves, including Stephen Sondheim, uh, into an apparent dialogue between her snarky recollections and his wise and witty footnotes, uh, adding context, confirmation, contradiction, at least down one, down one downright disagreement. Uh, Shia is the funniest book the East Hampton star has ever asked me to review and it printed all the naughty words. Uh, maybe you'll hear some of them now. And more delightful details from Jesse Green himself. Mr. Green, thanks again for doing this. My pleasure. I'd, I'd rather think I don't need to be here. You know the book so well. well you should take over. Well, no, I, we, we've done this before and uh, you- <laughs> yeah, I'm very impressed. It's only fresher in my mind. <laughs> uh, despite title, everyone who's read the book finds it anything but shy. Uh, but what about Mary herself? Was she as snarky as her memoirs from birth, uh, actually overcompensating for innate shyness as the princess in the musical was? Or was it a natural reaction to the intimidating world of show business stardom in which she grew up? Yes, to all of it. <laughs> uh, she, she had an extremely refined and delicate uh, sensibility at heart as the princess does in Once Upon a Mattress but there was no way in the family she grew up in with you know possibly America's greatest musical theater artist as your father and possibly America's greatest ice princess as your mother that you were <laughs> that kind of sensitivity uh, another song in, in uh, Once Upon a Mattress was going to survive unless you developed a pretty thick skin and also pretty sharp quills both of which she did. So um, I think it was a reaction to the way she grew up, but also a protection uh, as she tried to make her way forward, not just in a difficult business, which of course the theater always is, but in a, a difficult business in which your father was the leading figure and you are in the very same field. In fact, famously, they were up for a Tony Award the same year, 1959, he, he won. The book's dialogue format was something of a gift from the mother Mary so long felt was so remote. Uh, remind us uh, who Dorothy Rogers was, how she and her daughter clashed, but ultimately made peace or at least collaborated in print. Yeah, it was, let's call it a separate piece. Um, <laughs> so Mary's mother, Dorothy Rogers, uh, was 
a very clever woman who had, a, a, you know, a lot of things that she was capable of, but being of her generation, maybe it was a little better by Mary's, but it still wasn't that great then. But her mother's generation, there wasn't very much she could do with it except try to snag a good husband, which was not exactly what I would call Richard Rogers. Uh, he was a famous husband and a genius, but uh, kind of a nasty and depressed uh, Lothario. So uh, she had her own demons to face, but uh, she, along the way, she was uh, a writer herself. She was an inventor. She invented something called the Johnny Mop, uh, which you can imagine what that is. And she was a decorator and uh, just a generally clever person who restricted her cleverness to a kind of uh, self-polishing uh, elite world that she wanted to be part of. And, uh, and there came a time when there was an offer from uh, McCall's magazine, as it happens, if any of you remember that magazine in the 70s, that they wanted to do an advice column. And the idea was that she and Mary would turn. So the way it was printed, there would be a question, uh, which oh supposedly were from I readers. I was just calling to follow on our call. Go ahead. I was afraid Dorothy Rogers had somehow <laughs> come from the grave to to listen in. Um, no, uh, so so they um, uh, questions supposedly written by readers, but probably in fact written by editors would be posed. You know, things like my son wants to bring his fiance to Thanksgiving weekend with us. Can we allow them to stay in the same room? Questions like that. And the two women would give their different answers based on their personalities and their generations. And the two answers would be printed in different colors of ink, so you could easily distinguish between them. Later, it was turned into a book called A Word to the Wives. A uh, uh, yes, a word, a word to the Wives. And um, that was kind of a clue to me, because when, I, when Mary and I started talking about what the book should be like, she had a long list of things she did not want it to be. Uh, the first thing she didn't want it to be was anything like either of her parents' books, um, of which uh, Richard Rogers wrote a memoir and her mother wrote four books, at which Mary considered all completely, you know, fantasies. Um, she did not want them, she didn't want an as then I told, as then I, and then I wrote kind of told to book. She didn't want a dry recitation. She just wanted it to be the kind of thing she loved to create herself and the kind of thing she loved to see, pure fun. Not ignoring anything real, but seeing reality, no matter how grim, through a kind of fun lens. And uh, it became clear as we talked that to, to get what she wanted and to get what I wanted, which was for readers to have the experience of her voice unimpeded, we needed to have two voices in the book so that you can read her full strength, not diluted, not on the rock, just neat, uh, straight through. And yet there are things that she, being merry and being honest to her own voice, would not be able to say. She wouldn't stop at some point and say, Richard Rogers, the great American composer, you know, she just said, daddy. And so there, this other voice had to come in to supply the information that she was not going to supply. Or, I mean, this is all, you know, a created structure. We, we talked about it and this was what we came up with and what I later had to carry out mostly on my own. Yeah, some people, uh, friends of mine who've read it, you know, say those footnotes, I usually, I, I just, put, I, I wait and I read them afterwards. I said, no, no, you have to get stiff neck because it's a dialogue. You have to go back and forth. You can't say, oh, I'll get to that later. Um, talk a little about uh, her father. Um, also too remote, she felt. She excused it because of his genius. She said genius could excuse anything except Arthur Lawrence, <laughs> famously. Um, remind us uh, what their relationship was like and um, in relation to both her music and, and her life in general as he witnessed it. Well, he was highly critical and felt from a Mary's youngest age that she was failing to be the kind of daughter that he wanted, which in a way was no daughter. Um, he wasn't really fit 
to be a father in that sense. But if she, if he was going to be a father, he wanted someone uh, who looked great in a tight skirt. And Mary was overweight through a lot of her childhood. He told her she was just a fat ape. Why do you have to have your arms hanging down that way? She had a big smile, which he didn't like, too many teeth. Her laugh was loud. I mean, if you wa watching that that uh, kinescope of Carol Burnett, I was suddenly realizing that that is Mary. That's how she laughed. That's how her mouth was. That's how big she was. Uh, and and as she said of Carol Burnett, she too could be heard in Brooklyn, even if she was <laughs> speaking in Manhattan. Um, so, you know, he was not happy with her as a child. And then as she became a composer and started to write her own work, he wasn't that interested in her work, even though uh, there were rumors at the time that he wrote her work. Uh, it wasn't imagined that a woman could possibly write musicals. There really had been almost no composers of, uh, who were women in the history of Broadway, a couple, but almost no one who had written a whole show. And, uh, you know, no matter how often she said, he, he, why would he write my songs? He doesn't even like my songs. <laughs> These rumors continued. And uh, when she would show him his music, he would typically criticize it. Why did you do that? I wouldn't have done that. That doesn't make sense to me. And then she just stopped showing him. So none of that was a very uh, happy experience. On the other hand, when she got herself into bad scrapes, marital or otherwise, uh, mo monetary or marital, I guess, uh, he and Dorothy did step in and save her butt. So uh, she had to give them credit for that. And as far as her father was concerned, he came around in his older age as he began to be, uh, as, as his gifts began to wane, he felt. He leaned on her for help. In fact, asked her to be ready to write the lyrics for The Sound of Music in case Oscar Hammerstein, who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and yet not told that. His family was told and his partner was told, but he was not told. Uh, in case he should die during the writing of it, Mary was uh, on tap to take up wow. the, the pen. Uh, as it happened, he lasted and he wrote the, his final song, Edelweiss, before dying. As a kid, Mary fancied that Hammerstein would have made a better father. Uh, yes. But as a songwriter herself, years later, she preferred, as I must say, I do the lyrics of Roger's first collaborator, uh, Tiny Troubled Lawrence Larry Hart. Uh, talk about the two of them. I mean, he seemed like he was almost a playmate to her at times. Well, they were of similar height. Yes. Uh, and uh, both of them were trying to escape her father. Um, <laughs> uh, Larry Hart called Richard Rogers the principal. And uh, Rogers called Larry Hart the shrimp and worse, um, yeah. <laughs> as you'll read. But um, yes, uh, Larry Hart was the, the person trying to escape from Richard Rogers, but devilishly clever. And when Rogers could get him to work, and I, you know, I have to give credit to Rogers. He somehow got this guy to work despite his, you know, weeks long benders and his incredible avoidance uh, and to create some of these astonishingly playful lyrics, um, which, you know, not to put Hammerstein down at all, but it's, it's as if they were from different worlds. And in some ways they were. Uh, so there's the stories of, oh, when, when Mary would get sick at school, and by the way, the school doctor was Dr. Spock, um, and needed to be picked up, uh, you know, she couldn't necessarily get her parents to take enough interest to come pick her up. But Larry Hart would or he'd send his car. So, so they, they, were, they were pretty close. And um, uh, I, th I, I think she also identified with his bad boyness. And she, she considered herself as a child, uh, or looking back on her childhood, she thought of herself as rotten and loved that. And she wrote a children's book called The Rotten Book to kind of glorify rottenness. Uh, the Richard Dorothy relationship was shaped in part by his drinking and more than just an eye for other ladies of which she was well aware. You have a footnote about that involving a new sports car that my wife hates <laughs> me to repeat. So please, you do it. Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, basically, I, I don't I, I was not able to prove that this happened, but it was too good not to at least put in a footnote. 
Um, apparently he had a new sports car and he was taking Dorothy out for a spin and he was like, he had the key and he couldn't find the ignition to put the key into. And finally, Dorothy said, if it had hair around it, you'd find it. <laughs> um, and uh, Mary once found herself drawing the tears of one of her father's discarded playmates. I think in Philadelphia, you write. Uh, tell us that story. Yeah, I'm trying to remember it myself. Was it was it uh, a, a chorus girl? The chorus in girl, the, right. In, in, in the cast. Yes, um, this is a chorus girl who was in Mary's sh show, uh, A Famous Bomb, um, starring uh, Judy Holliday, um, called, um, what, what, what was the name of it? She played a Peace Corps volunteer, Hotspot. And right. uh, the show was doing very poorly. It was extremely chaotic in, in Philadelphia. It's kind of a classic out of town nightmare with, you know, people being shipped in secretly through one elevator and out through another elevator. And, um, and she, one of the chorus girls didn't show up and was said to be very sick. And she went to her room to check on her and see if she could wanted some soup. And uh, the, the, as it turned out, she wasn't sick. She was just jilted by Mary's father. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a fun social situation, <laughs> like you ought to imagine for a moment. <laughs> uh, it seemed to me that seeing big Broadway shows when her parents finally permitted it uh, was not as important to Mary's uh, ultimate love of theater as were her early uh, out of town and summer stock experiences. Talk about that, especially the times at Tamament in Pennsylvania's Pocono Mountains, uh, what she did with whom and, and how it all affected her. Well, I'll just say that going to see her father's shows, as you say, she, they didn't let her, you know, see, go to opening nights until she was well into her teens, but she was allowed to go to the orchestra, the first orchestra rehearsal with the cast. We not, we call it the Sitz Probe, but, uh, and those were meant a great deal to her because that was the way she felt love from her father. She heard the love in the music. It was her ear was connected to her heart in that way. And so was his. He didn't have any other love except what he put in, in that music and, and she got it. So those were very important moments to her. She was finally allowed to go to the opening of Carousel and um, that was an overwhelming experience. He had, well, you'll read where he was during the opening night of Carousel. Anyway, um, but, that's about mother, that's about father and daughter. In terms of her own uh, theatrical career and her own life, you're right. You, it was these experiences with other young people, as for all of us in whatever fields we're in, when we're just starting out and we make these intense friendships with other people who, you know, are just scraping around looking for a way to get ahead in their fields. She had been at the, at, um, Westport, the uh, theater in Connecticut, and was uh, an intern there along with Sondheim and several others, and they, uh, you know, really bonded there. And uh, um, Tamament was a different story. Tamament was sort of a uh, an out of town talent lab for musical theater people. Uh, they had guests coming, uh, you know, middle class uh, uh, young singles basically would come for a week looking to, you know, find a spouse and to entertain them among other things, including the golf and the pool and all of that, they would put on shows. So the, the resort hired a bunch of writers and one summer those writers included Mary um, and Marshall Bearer, who was uh, later to become her co frequent collaborator. And uh, also there happened to be that summer, Woody Allen and a lot of other names you would know. And they decided they would try to write a musical based on The Princess and the Pea. And um, that from the time that the head of the place, whose name actually was Mo Hack, if you can believe it, I didn't make it up. Uh, from the time he okayed their doing the show to the time an audience came in to see it was three weeks. Uh, fully orchestrated, fully costumed, fully designed show. Not very much like the show that wound up on Broadway and in my high school, but still 
um, enough to get it to Broadway and then my high school. Um, and it's a fascinating story and I think useful for anyone who wants to know how you really put the musical together. Um, and the cleverness of its construction is part of why it's lasted so long. And also a kind of accidental brilliance, which is that because Mohack had nine paid uh, leading actors in the company, he wanted nine principal roles in the show. Um, and so that makes it an incredible choice for uh, amateur and uh, school productions all around the world, because the, the more big roles there are, the more parents are paying for ads in the program. It's very successful that way. Um, and uh, the, the relationship she made working on that show and working at Westport lasted the rest of her life, or in the case of Marshall Bearers, the rest of his. She called him, fully knowing that Sondheim was the greatest lyricist uh, in, in American musical theater, she called him, uh, this, the, I think the phrase is the second greatest lyricist and the first worst house guest. Um, <laughs> he was kind of a crazy guy uh, uh, and one of the several gay men she thought about marrying until well, her father finally and, and she did marry one uh, we should mention that she knew Sondheim since they were pre-teens and Sondheim was, a, was a, for him Hammerstein was a mentor and they met uh, at his farm and so they, they knew each other for a long time and played all kinds of games. Uh, talk about that, that relationship. And um, since you've talked about marriage, uh, she wrote a famous shit or get off the pot letter, which led them to, tr to, to try a trial marriage uh, in the townhouse next to Catherine Hepburn's. Well, I have to say there were a lot of things that Mary told me that made my jaw drop. <laughs> but this, this one, I mean, this one really took the cake. Yeah, they, they met when she was 13 and he was 14 at uh, Hammerstein. She called him Aki uh, at uh, Aki's uh, Bucks County home where he was one of the many kind of strays and uh, orphans of privilege, as she calls them, that uh, the Hammersteins collected. And she was visiting. Uh, she thinks her father was there for the weekend to work on Carousel. And um, she met this boy and they played chess, three games. He beat her about instantly, three times. And then he got up and went to the piano and played Gershwin. And that was it for her. She was in love with him basically for the rest of her life. Um, what, what does it mean to be in love with Stephen Sondheim when you're Mary Rogers? It, <laughs> it means a lot of things. But if, 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 as I said before, your heart is connected to your ear, it means the love of the brilliance of the talent. And that really to her was almost more erotic than, than sexuality, uh, as it would have to be since they did have this trial marriage and he was gay. Um, it's, you'll, if you read it, you'll see it's about the most skin crawliest scene I've ever written in my life. Um, <laughs> they are so awkward and unsure of what they're doing and uh and they clearly love each other but th there is no way that this could work and after a little while they they called it off and, and remained friends for the rest of, of their lives as well with occasional interruptions for fits of peak and such but she did marry her first husband um she didn't know he was gay but everyone else seemed to uh and uh, that that marriage produced three great children but was otherwise kind of a disaster and fairly abusive. And that was also news to me. And also sadly news to uh, their children who didn't know about those episodes. So um, uh, there were plenty of things in the book, although Mary was characteristically chipper and unwilling to cry about anything except nice things. She, she found it, she, what she found moving, what she would cry about was when somebody forgave someone else or when somebody said something nice without any uh, cause just just to be nice those things moved her but uh the truly sad things in her life she was kind of locked down about and that was certainly one of them and when she told me you know i had to have she frequently was telling me oh will you stop whining and weeping over there so uh because, anyway i don't know if i've really answered your question but she she got to, it got to be such a thing with her and her love for gay men 
which I find as a gay man very touching and really quite understandable uh, that her father finally took her aside and said, why don't you go all the way and marry Truman Capote? <laughs> who was indeed the resident of a house in Brooklyn that a stage designer who uh, was trying to per persuade Mary and, and her husband, Hank, uh, not to move into their house, but into their neighborhood. And one of the attractions was that Capote was living, I guess, downstairs and uh, in renting a room there. Um, but she, she actually is quite eloquent about the appeal of gay men. I think you said she says every woman ought to marry a gay man at least once. But what, what was it about gay men? Uh, yourself included, that she found so appealing as opposed to uh, uh, other sexual experiences of which there was no shortage, uh, as you were. Oh, yeah. She had. She, well, I'll leave myself out of it, but I, I know that she felt an extreme kinship with gay men who also were trying to find ways to live their life honestly uh, in a world that did not permit them, in essence, to come out. She felt exactly the same way. She had been told, you know, all her life that she didn't fit. She was too big. She was too this. She was a woman in a man's field. So she got all of that. Um, and, you know, as she said about the sex, she said, you know, there's many ways to skin a cat. I didn't really get into I didn't really want her to detail that for me. But uh, she was alluding to the idea that, you know, most of the men she knew of that era who were straight um, were trapped themselves in a kind of idea of masculinity that uh, did not allow them to, to try to understand what women wanted, whether you know emotionally or even in bed. And she, was, she had more ways of being satisfied uh, sometimes with some of uh, her gay partners than she did with some of her straight partners. Um, I should mention you. You said Hank, her second husband. That was her second husband, right. not her first husband. Right. And with with Hank, she had three more children. So One this, this is, oh, by the way, so she's not just a woman in a man's field in the nineteen, you know, fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties. She's also the mother of six kids, trying to do all this. It's really astounding. And and saying that uh, in the period between her marriages, that uh, she thought bed was the uh, the proper or improper way to pay for a nice dinner. Um, well, she certainly was looking for a way to be loved and to love in a world that hadn't really shown her any good models for it, not just because of her parents, but the world around her, the, the men she had access to, unless they were in the theater generally, uh, just were, were not the kind of men she wanted to be around. Plus, she had rather high standards for brilliance, didn't she, <laughs> between her father and Sondheim. So, um, yeah, she that that a very uh, active marital interregnum, uh, <laughs> um, you know, is, is a juicy part of the book. But why shouldn't she? You know, she kept saying to me, she said, I know my kids don't want me to talk about this, but this is the truth and people should know it. If, if she felt that she had been cheated in a way of the knowledge uh, that women before her might have had because they wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't talk about these things. And she wasn't going to do that herself. It's really interesting. I mean, she, she comes from a showbiz family. She has personal show business experience, but she ends up with a second career writing children's books, children's songs. Um, I mean, she says, I think at one point in the book that uh, given the way she was raised, she didn't think she could say no to any offer, personal or professional. Uh, and then she, uh, because of her position, uh, became the chairman of the board of, of, uh, of Juilliard. So talk a little bit, bit about her encouragement of young talent generally, uh, her role as board chair at Juilliard, and her reaction to the honor it ultimately bestowed on her, uh, a water fountain? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, I want to say um, she, the books she wrote were more what you would call young adult books. They weren't children's books per se. It's, and I only say that because Freaky Friday, which was one of them, uh, has been, was and has remained an incredible hit uh, and has been turned into movies more than once and musicals more than once. Um, and it's worth noting that it's the story of a mother and daughter who change places. 
Uh, and again, she's working out for herself what it could mean to be a different kind of mother than the mother she had. So, what than the one she was. Uh, full second career she had, and feel that she had to say to men was that men are too hung up on enormous success in the first thing they try. And um, if they don't succeed at a sterling level in the thing they set out to do, they feel like total failures. And women, at least in her experience, have the capacity to move on to other things and to enjoy life that way. And as much as she feels her family wanted her, her, her kids wanted her to stick with one thing and keep at it and, until she made it in the biggest way, like which would never have happened because she wasn't going to be her father or Sondheim. She wanted to try all the arrows in her quiver and she did and she made amazing successes with all of them. So yes, in the third part of her, her triptych of, uh, you know, uh, employment or life events, she did become, uh, uh, you know, very interested in educational philanthropy, uh, quite a number of schools leading up to the chairmanship of Juilliard. Now, yes, she said that they forced her to put her name on something at Juilliard, even though she didn't want to, because they find it easier to get other people to give money if you lead by example and put your name on something. And she claimed not to know what the thing was. She, she believed it was a, maybe a water fountain, as she said, on some high tour of Juilliard. I, I looked into it and it turned out it was a very nice suite of offices uh, right near an elevator on the second floor. So she literally never saw it. Um, that's how little that mattered to her. It, it wasn't a pretense. It wasn't, you know, noblesse oblige. That's really who she was. What she cared about was the kids. She, by all accounts, was the first chairman of Juilliard who actually knew who the students were and spent time with them and promoted them. She had these wonderful parties and she would always have the musicians over to play a concert for, you know, her friends, you know, when, and her friends were not nobody. Um, and she was also frequently slipping a little or a lot of money uh, uh, into their pockets when they needed it and helping a lot of the, especially the young women out of trouble when they got into it. Um, and I think in many ways it, it was the most satisfying of her three careers because it was directly successful in, in promoting what she cared about, which was musical talent. She confesses at one point that she preferred pregnancy to composing, uh, but also felt guilty that work often took her away from motherhood. Uh, soon after Adam's birth, she let a friend of mine hold him as an infant and presciently predicted that uh, the infant would come closer to her father's musical genius than she ever did, uh, which Adam has now with two Tony Awards. But Mary also admits at a point of having some problems understanding Adam's music in a way like her father did hers. Yes, that's interesting, although lovingly so, as opposed to unlovingly so. She admired, oh my God, she admired her son's work. She just loved it, um, as do I. And But what she said was there came a point when he was so far beyond her, harmonically especially, that th there wasn't much more she could teach him. She was, uh, I, I think, helpful to him at a certain phase in his composing uh, life. Um, and her her theme was to encourage him to understand that the ear likes to find its way home, which is an interesting way of putting it. But uh, when you're writing songs for the musical theater, there's an, a, a feeling you get when you return to the home key and somehow you want to be able to do that. And uh, that, that's really quite a psychological insight as well as an auditory insight. But um, yes, he, you know, he, uh, in a way, moved, moved the family sound even further. I will say there are a number of shows she wrote later in her life uh, after, um, you know, that didn't get produced or were produced out of town or there were various disasters involving the rights. There's a, she wrote a version of um, 
the member of the wedding, the Carson McCullers book and play. Uh, she and Marshall Bear wrote a musical version of it. And basically what happened was the they had not fully pinned down the rights, the underlying rights, and it, they were revoked. And so that full score, which is beautiful, and which contains music that is uh, that sort of foresees Adam Gettle's music. It, you hear in it some of the her father, but you also hear it moving toward her son. Uh, that music, unfortunately, can never be performed in a theatrical context, although some of it is available uh, as individual songs on uh, CDs. Another friend of mine who dated Adam for some time said Mary sometimes came across as jealous of her son and even mean. Uh, you have a telling anecdote about the two of them at the Tony Awards, which I didn't take to be so mean when I read it. But after listening to her account, I, it, it sounds like maybe like the iceberg, there was a little bit more uh, than uh, on the surface. Well, I never, can, I never saw her be mean to anyone. And, but I understood how people might respond to her uh, lack of a veneer, uh, let's say, as meanness. And, and, that, and this anecdote is really a very good example of it, uh, as some people do find it to be kind of shockingly cold. I don't. So I'll just read it because I have it in front of me. She's <laughs> talking about Adam and she says, um, uh, I worry for him as I don't for any of the others. He has, like Daddy, a great need to be great. But the marketplace for what he does is not what it was for what Daddy did. That's a recipe for disappointment if you care about recognition. And who doesn't? I did a terrible thing once, out of fear, when the light in the piazza was up for 11 Tony Awards and had already won five. We were sitting in Radio City, and just as they were about to announce the award for Best Musical, he turned to me, I was a row behind him, two seats over, and said, I love you, Mom. And I said right back, it's going to be Spamalot. Um, and it was Spamalot that, that won, but he had already won for best, uh, for best scores, so that was okay. So you could read that as a kind of cold and unmotherly thing to say, or you could read that as someone wanting to protect her son from what she believed was in, going to happen and was right, was going to happen by moderating his expectations. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of both. You say she had a way of putting you and many others at ease, uh, especially when it came to paying for a shared meal. Uh, one of my favorite Mary lines. Well, she used this line a lot in different formulations for a lot of people I later discovered. But, um, you know, I guess we had gone out to dinner and her, her husband, Hank, had this Extreme, oh, he was almost like a magician with the check. But, you know, he, he would start to look for the check and it was not only gone, but, you, you know, the, the the whole, the receipt was pocketed. It was all done and you didn't know what had happened. I, I call him the uh, silent major domo. And um, afterward, we were, go we were going to a concert at Carnegie Hall. And uh, as we crossed the street, I said to Mary, you know, I, I didn't intend for you to pay for that dinner. And she said, when your father writes Oklahoma, you can pay the check. Um, which as I say, w was, was just something she knew to say. It really helped people get over that awkward moment in a typical Mary way. It helped by going right into it and out of it. You know, she acknowledged it and moved right through it with a joke. And uh, I never did question that again, although my father did. He wasn't very happy about that line. <laughs> Well, I see it's we're we're getting to almost 10 minutes before the the hour is up. I, I'm going to see if I can read some questions from the chat and, and I have a couple of more as well. But let me see what I can read here. Uh, well, somebody says he deeply, Michael Petrellis, I deeply wish there was an index for many reasons, especially to read passages about Lorraine's heart. Why no index? Uh, that's a good question, Michael, and I'm going to answer it in a minute. I have to take these out because they just died. One sec. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Not as well. I cannot hear you, though. Um, all right. Um, 
rhino index. Uh, we did not want people to look things up. That's why. We want people to read the book, enjoy it like a novel. That's how we both thought of it. Uh, I mean, an odd novel, but still uh, a novel. And um, not go searching for someone's name or anything like that. Also, I had the feeling, I didn't want footnotes even. They weren't supposed to be footnotes. They were originally supposed to be different colors of ink, like in the uh, art of, uh, the uh, magazine pieces with her mother. Uh, and that was too expensive. And then they were supposed to be side notes. That, uh, but that was also too expensive. So they ran up footnotes, but you'll notice there's no numbers. They're all what they call dingbats, little symbols. We just didn't, we didn't want any kind of paraphernalia that suggested academia. And that was another reason not to have an index. Also, do you know how hard it is to make an index? <laughs> they pay people. Uh, why did it take so long to write the book? Was it that you happen to have a day job that's also a night job? <laughs> Was that, was that your comment about the night job? Yes. <laughs> I, I do have quite a, a night job. In fact, I'm going to the theater right after this with my little pen and pad in hand. Um, well, that was only part of it. I mean, I didn't get the job at the Times until 2017. Uh, and although I had been working as a critic uh, for New York Magazine, even while, I was, while Mary was still alive. So uh, yes, there was there was a problem of time. There was a problem of money, because um, you know I, I had to work at the work that was paying me. Uh, so there was that. But the following things were really the problem. By the time we really finished getting through her whole life in these wonderful conversations twice a week for two and a half years. Um, and I had hundreds and hundreds of pages of notes. Mary was declining in a way that I was not really admitting to myself. And she was trying to show me that and tell me that, and I just wasn't having it. I had lost my mother some years before that, and she was kind of this wonderful anti mame substitute mother, um, you know, maybe even better than being her actual child. Uh, you don't have to ask her children that. But, um, and when she did die, first of all, I'd written only 10 pages. And so I felt kind of uh, bereft personally, but also professionally. I, what was I going to do without her to approve the pages? Let me stop you there for a minute, because you did get her reaction to the first 10 pages that, that you brought to her uh, and uh, saw lots of markings on the pages and had great anxiety. So tell us about that scene and what her final words, her words about those, those, those only pages that she saw. Well, I had decided that a good way to start was um, with a series of games that she played because we had a, a pretty deep catalog of them from her childhood the ear training games that she played with her father, the math games she hated with her mother. And uh, when she was uh, a young person, the, the, uh, the, uh, when she was a mother, their game she played with her family and the game she played with Sondheim and her pals and all of that. So I wrote that and I gave it to her and it introduced the way I was planning to do the footnotes and have her say daddy and, say, you know, all of those issues that I had worked out with her or on my own. And she was just not quite happy with it. I could tell she wasn't, but she wasn't saying it, which was uncharacteristic of her. And finally, I said, Mary, just what what's bothering you? Uh, and she said, make it meaner, make it funnier. And that was a little shocking because the title of the first section is Hostilities. And <laughs> it includes these extremely hostile games that she would play with Arthur Lawrence and Steve Sondheim and other people. And I thought it was awfully funny. Um, but what I what I. What I now think she was telling me, first of all, was that it was going to be on me the rest of the way, because I think she knew. And that more than anything else, what she wanted was for readers to have the experience we had had talking about her life, which for whatever sadnesses and meannesses was a blast. And she wanted to make sure that readers had that 
with with no apology. And um, and I took that to heart. However, you know, I was grieving and it took me a while to get back uh, in the saddle. And then I had to figure it all out by myself. Um, and I couldn't just call her and say, no, wait, when you said you converted to Catholicism, by the way, um, and the priest who taught you the catechism disappeared when he was supposed to show up to do the actual job, and you think he went to a drunk tank, why do you, why do you think that happened? <laughs> I couldn't ask her that. And so there ensued a month of searching until, and I found him. I mean, he was dead, but I found that it really was so. And it had happened the way she said. Um, so everything, you know, that just took way longer than it would have. And then I had those jobs. And that was that was the uh, that was the other reason. It, it was not the case, as some people have said, that we were waiting for Sondheim to die. For instance, that uh, several people have said that. Um, I will admit that that made it easier in some ways because I don't need to get I didn't need to get another angry note from him like I had gotten many of during my life. But um, um, I would never. We were ready to publish on the date we were going to publish regardless of what happened and he knew the book he knew about the book he, we had talked about it uh somebody has asked why sondheim was a bad house guest i'm sorry it was marshall bearer who was uh you know the second best lyricist in the country and the worst house guest um you make the yeah. point that the family was very cooperative with the understanding that they had no oversight and no right of approval. So how did that work and what has their reaction been to the book? Mary made a, an amazing decision and a document to back it up, which was that she did not want her children to have, to have say over what was in the book because she knew what they would want to take out or she felt she did. And so she wrote a document which said that they were not to read it and until it was finished, uh, meaning in galleys. I mean, until it was at a point where, the, you know, and, the, and even then they couldn't alter anything. Um, she nominated a family member who, as it happens, is in publishing. And as it happens, was it Farrar Strauss, my publisher, and uh, named Sarah Crichton, a wonderful editor, to be the family representative. And it was her job to read the book when it was finished and decide alone whether the book was what Mary would have wanted. And if it was, that was it. That was the end of it. So Mary did that for me. It was a wonderful thing and a lot to ask of her children, if you ask me. And I have to say, they've been wonderful. Um, they're each, five of them have survived. E each of them is very different, incredibly smart, as you can imagine, tough and sharp with a quip. Um, but each in their own way, they've been very supportive. I think they would have each liked certain things to be emphasized more than other things, and maybe they'll write their own book uh, or their responses to it. But um, I have to say they've been brilliant. And uh, in that last phase between galleys and publication, I did get the benefit of some fact-checking with them to make sure that things were right. Well, I'm pleased to, to say that Sarah Crichton was a colleague of mine at Newsweek for a while before she moved into publishing and uh, uh, was quite successful there. And I've been delighted to follow her progress. And it is now 629 and you have a show to go to. Uh, and uh, we promised you uh, an hour and we promised everybody an hour. So let me thank Jesse Green so much. Uh, we've had our questions from the audience, uh, almost all of them. And uh, I, I want to thank again the Hampton Library and uh, all of you. And remember to order your copy of the book uh, in the chat. Um, it's been or get it at a library. Or well, okay. <laughs> Look, I, I'd love the money, although <laughs> that's another story. But um, you know, it's uh, that's why we have libraries, and we need to have them. So do you whistle Rogers and Hammerstein and Rogers and Hart songs differently now that you've gone through this whole experience? Well, I certainly don't whistle the ones that Mary hated so much. For instance, what she called the uh, big, thick Brahmsian hymns for contralto ladies. <laughs> um, 
you know, you'll never walk alone. And, you know, th those the are anthems, the anthems, the anthems, the anthems. Yes. Yeah. She really hated those. And she really hated the praying larks and the sound of music. Like she, she said, wouldn't it have been more interesting if they were like praying narcs or something? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I've gotten a lot more into Rogers and Hart than I used to be. I mean, I grew up with Rogers and Hammerstein, so I didn't know that stuff as well. I knew it, but not as well. And now I know it quite well. And I think a lot about the song of theirs that she kept on a music stand in her living room. The only song that she kept uh, of her father's. Um, uh, Which was? Too tr <laughs> um, he was too true to be good. He was too good to me. Uh, the title is, uh, I can't remember which phrase is the title now, but the kicker is he was too too good to, be, to true. be true. He was yeah. too good to be true. Well, well I hum it. I don't sing the lyrics. My favorite is the boys from Syracuse. This could go on all evening, but we've all got things to do. I thank you again for doing this. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. It was a pleasure reading the book and writing the reviews and uh, getting all of you guys into it. Thank you so much, and thanks, everybody, who, who joined us, and thanks to the libraries especially. Very good. Okay, Lisa, take us away. Have a great night. Read the book. Thanks for coming.